Welcome back to the playlist on nucleotide catabolism. And specifically, we're looking at purine catabolism. Okay. And what we've been doing in the last few videos is we've been looking at the degradation pathway for adenosine and adenosine monophosphate. And just keep in mind that we started with adenosine monophosphate that's generated by many reactions in humans. And when we have adenosine monophosphate, just like all purines and pyrimidines, We'd like to have a way to get rid of it because, as we'll talk about in another video, more specifically, it's not good to have lots of nucleotides just floating around the cell. So if you have excess that you don't need for RNA synthesis and um, DNA synthesis, you'd like to have a way to get rid of those and keep them at fairly low levels inside the cell. Okay, So you have to catabolize them. Okay, That's the intuition you need to keep in your mind. So we started with... Uh, adenosine monophosphate and through a phosphatase we got adenosine. Once we had adenosine we used adenosine deaminase and we spent a few videos on that and once we use adenosine deaminase we got this molecule right here which I'm going to underline or let me actually circle it. This molecule is called inosine and if you wanted to get the chemical structure of inosine it's shown right here. So this molecule right here this is called inosine. Okay, there's several things about inosine that you should be aware of. Um, number one is the actual nitrogenous base that, can, that um, is part of inosine, and that's this molecule right here. So if you were to basically take inosine, this component of it, and you were to imagine that the ribose ring was replaced with a proton, then this molecule right here, as a purine nitrogenous base by itself, would be referred to as hypoxanthine. Okay, and actually hypoxanthine, as you can see from this uh, very short reaction scheme right here, is going to be a product of this reaction. And we actually have a whole video on hypoxanthine catabolism to uric acid or urate. And urate, it turns out, is the end product of purine catabolism in humans and other great apes and hominid species. Okay, that's the topic of another video. Okay, now this enzyme, which is called purine nucleoside phosphorylase, it's important to realize that this particular enzyme, just like adenosine deaminase, has a more uh, larger specificity than some other enzymes that we've been dealing with in the past. So let me just sort of write for you down here several molecules that this could react with. Okay, so let me do this in a bold color. So number one, we know that this enzyme, as shown right here, which is the mechanism I'm going to show in just a minute, this can react with inosine. Okay, that's one of the substrates that can do it. But let's say that you started with deoxyadenosine monophosphate. Well, you would use a phosphatase to cleave off the 5' phosphate, in which case you get deoxyadenosine. And then you'd react that with adenosine deaminase, and you'd get this molecule, which is called deoxy deoxyinosine okay this reacts with deoxyinosine and that'll still give you hypoxanthine but instead the other product which is shown right here would not be ribose 1-phosphate it would instead be deoxyribose 1-phosphate and eventually we'll have a video on what happens to that okay so we have inosine and deoxyinosine there's another molecule it can react with and that's xanthosine so there are some products or some pathways in humans that can give us xanthosine. It turns out that this enzyme can react with that. And there's two main others it can react with. In number, the, the other one that sort of parallels adenosine catabolism, which is guanosine. Guanosine. We'll have a whole video on uh, guanosine catabolism. We'll actually look at the mechanism um, of that enzyme here. And then the other one that can react with, you would guess, is deoxyguanosine. Okay? So these right here, these guys, are the main five substrates for purine nucleoside phosphorylase. So if any of these guys accumulate and you're not doing DNA synthesis, you're not doing nucleotide synthesis, you would like to get rid of these guys because you don't want high levels of them floating around the cell. So catabolize them. Okay? So without boring you any further, let's actually look at the mechanism of purine nucleoside phosphorylase. Okay? So one thing to realize about this enzyme is it's, number one, 
it's a, an inorganic phosphate dependent reaction. So this molecule that's shown right here, this is inorganic phosphate. And the very first step of the mechanism, which, and I'll do those mechanistic steps in green, a critical histidine residue in the active site is going to deprotonate the inorganic phosphate, one of the ways you'd find it at physiological pH, into the fully deprotonated state. And this fully deprotonated state of phosphate, this is ultimately going to be the nucleophile in this reaction. There's actually some pretty cool organic chemistry that comes to play in this reaction scheme. Okay, And that's going to lead us to the next mechanistic step in which we have inosine. Okay? Now in this step, we're going to get something called a carbon-nitrogen heterolysis reaction. This is one of the mechanistic steps in purine nucleoside phosphorylase. So what's going to end up happening is this lone pair, one of them that's on the oxygen here, of the ribofuranose ring is going to kick in here to form an oxonium cation. So this functional group right here, let me circle it in purple. This functional group right here that you see as the product of this mechanistic step, this is called an oxonium, an oxonium cation. Okay, It's very unstable. Okay, it's very unstable, and so it likes to react with nucleophiles, and we'll see how it does that in a minute. Now, whenever this oxonium ion forms, what ends up happening is you get loss of a leaving group. Okay, And so what ends up happening is the leaving group essentially is this hypoxanthine moiety. Okay, Now, here's something important to realize is that the hypoxanthine moiety is actually stabilized by a glutamine residue in the active site. So this is a critical glutamine residue. The amide of glutamine has, of course, protons on it, and each one of these protons has a partial positive charge. And this negative charge that develops on this nitrogen of hypoxanthine can actually interact electrostatically with the partial charge on that glutamine residue. And therefore, it creates an ion-dipole interaction. Or in some level, you can consider it a hydrogen bond. Okay. Now, what I want to uh, have you bear in mind about this mechanistic step is, number one, it's loss of a leaving group loss of leaving group and we'll see the implications of that in just a minute because in the next mechanistic step here's what's going to happen the phosphate that we originally generated by the histidine deprotonation is now going to nucleophilically attack this oxonium cation specifically the carbon that has the double bond keep in mind the oxonium cation is actually very unstable and so that's going to kick these pi electrons back onto the oxygen atom and it diminishes the positive charge and so what you get at the end of this mechanistic step is this molecule which is called ribose ribose 1-phosphate. We'll have to do a little bit of work to get that in a completely usable form, but essentially what's going to happen is that's going to react with phosphoglucomutase, giving that enzyme a little bit more specificity than just glucose 6-phosphate. But it's going to react with phosphoglucomutase to give us ribose 5-phosphate, and then we can do various things with that. Okay. And what I want to have you bear in mind is that, remember, in this last step, we did loss of a leaving group. And what's this step? Well, this step is nucleophilic, nucleophilic attack. So here's the question. Overall, these two steps, what is it? Well, if you think back to your freshman or sophomore organic chemistry, probably the first semester, what happened when you had loss of a leaving group followed by nucleophilic attack in a stepwise fashion? So this is a stepwise fashion. What was that? Well, that's a unimolecular substitution, or as people typically abbreviate it, SN1. This is an SN1 reaction sequence that occurs in purine nucleoside phosphorylase. And now we have ribose 1-phosphate, but we have this, this hypoxanthine that's sort of in the deprotonated state, and we have to regenerate the resting state of the enzyme. So the, this lone pair is going to kick back in here, and then these pi electrons are going to be kicked out, and they will reabstract the proton from this critical histidine residue in the active site. That regenerates histidine in the deprotonated state, whereby we can do another reaction, and that releases this guy. This guy, keep in mind, was called hypo, this is hypoxanthine. 
Okay, and hypoxanthine through an enzyme called xanthine oxidase is going to be oxidized into a molecule called xanthine. Specifically, what's going to happen in that reaction is this effective shift base right here is going to be oxidized into an amide, and that's going to make xanthine. And then xanthine is going to react with another xanthine oxidase will react with another shift base right here. And that shift base is going to be oxidized into an amide, and that's going to make urate. So the two shift bases that exist on this molecule will have been oxidized into amides, and that's going to give us urate, the end product of purine degradation in humans, upper-level primates, and all hominids. Okay? Other organisms can degrade urate further. Okay? But in terms of adenosine, in terms of adenosine catabolism, we've now seen the degradation to hypoxanthine. And in another video, go find that if you wish, uh, you can see the degradation and mechanism of hypoxanthine to xanthine and xanthine to urate. But here comes the fun part of any of these videos. We get to see the application of this. Okay, Basically, here's the idea. Okay, um, Whenever you have an inorganic phosphate-dependent enzyme, there's always a chance that you could get uncoupling of that reaction. Okay, so for example, if you think back to the glycolysis playlist or your knowledge of glycolysis, and you think back to the enzyme glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase, if you remember that reaction, keep in mind it depended on inorganic phosphate. So somewhere hidden within the reaction mechanism, what you ultimately got was this guy, which is inorganic phosphate, PI, inorganic phosphate. Okay, And then inorganic phosphate ultimately acted as a nucleophile, right? And that gave us that gave us 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, right? And if you somehow manage to get arsenate poisoning, so that's what this molecule is right here. I'll draw it in red because it's bad. This is arsenate. Arsenate behaves very similarly to phosphate. Let's take a little aside from this and look at the periodic table. So if you look at the periodic table and you go to group 5, which is the nicogens, you'll see nitrogen at the top, which is sort of in the second period. But once you go below that, you get into the third and fourth periods, and these guys can violate the octet rule. So below that, you have phosphorus, and below that, you have arsenic. And it turns out when the arsenic and phosphorus are in their fully oxygenated oxyanion forms, they look very similar, they have similar resonance structures, and they behave very similarly. And it turns out that many inorganic phosphate-dependent enzymes cannot distinguish between the phosphate and the arsenate. And so instead of using phosphate in the mechanism, arsenate will instead be used. And in terms of glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase, this can lead to an uncoupling of glycolysis in which you get a total net ATP of zero. And if that wasn't enough, arsenate can actually allosterically extremely inhibit the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which basically drastically lowers the amount of acetyl-CoA you produce, and that essentially uncouples the tricarboxylic acid cycle leading to an overall drastically reduced number of ATPs produced in the cell. But if that wasn't enough, arsenate can actually mess with nucleotide catabolism. And so this is what arsenate does. It's going to perform a very similar mechanism to what we saw just a few minutes ago. So when we generate this transient oxonium species in the active site, Arsenate can actually nucleophilically attack the oxonium carbon very similarly and, in fact, identically to the way that the phosphate does. And that basically collapses the oxonium species back into a cyclic ether. And now we have this molecule right here. Again, I'll draw it in red because it's a bad guy. This is called ribose. This is called ribose 1-arsenate. Ribose 1-arsenate. Okay? This is not a good guy, okay? But here's the idea, and this is the, the intuition you need to keep in your mind. It appears that the cell has an intrinsic understanding that keeping these nucleotide and deoxynucleotide levels extremely low 
is really important. It really likes and knows that you need to have that done. Okay, so this enzyme has another activity. Okay, an unusual activity. Okay, something that most enzymes don't have. It's actually able to detoxify the arsenate. Okay, and this is how it does it. We're not going to look at the mechanism of how it does it, but basically this is what happens. This enzyme has a coenzyme in it. I'll draw it in green because this is the good guy. This is called lipoate. And specifically at this point, this is lipoate in the totally reduced state. And through the action, uh, let, me, let me denote that this again, this is purine nucleoside phosphorylase. What this enzyme is going to do is it's going to reduce the arsenate into this molecule down here. Again, it's still bad, so I'll do it in red. This is called arsenite. In general, um, what will end up happening in humans is arsenate, if it's free arsenate, will react with an enzyme called arsenate reductase, which gives you arsenite. But it turns out that this enzyme, purine nucleoside phosphorylase, actually has some intrinsic arsenate reductase activity. Now, of course, if arsenate is being reduced into arsenite, then that means that the, that the lipoate is acting as the reducing agent. And so the reducing agent therefore gets oxidized. And so this form of lipoate right here, oops, let me do it in green, go back. This form of lipoate right here, this is the oxidized form, okay? So just like any redox reaction, you have to have something that gets reduced and therefore also something that gets oxidized. And so our final product in this particular reaction scheme is going to be ribose going to be ribose. So it turns out that this enzyme has some intrinsic arsenate reductase activity, and it does so through a lipoate coenzyme. Okay, just some interesting application of this enzyme. Okay, so hopefully you kind of see what this enzyme is for, okay, at least in terms of adenosine catabolism. We degrade adenosine to inosine through adenosine deaminase, and then this enzyme, essentially what it does is it cleaves off the ribose ring. Okay, so remember, this is a nucleoside, right? Inosine is a nucleoside. It has a nitrogenous base and it has a ribose ring. So we need to cleave off the ribose ring somehow. This was the mechanism about how we do it. So once we cleave off the ribose ring, we get hypoxanthine, which is shown at the end of the mechanism. So we get hypoxanthine. And ultimately, what will happen to that in another video is it will get degraded to xanthine by an enzyme called xanthine oxidase. And then xanthine oxidase has another activity. So this enzyme that does this, this is called xanthine oxidase. And then another activity of xanthine oxidase will degrade xanthine into urate. And urate is the end product of purine metabolism in humans upper level primates and certain hominids, okay? And so this, this reaction scheme right here of hypoxanthine to xanthine to urate, this is the topic of another video. We'll look at the mechanism of how that works and we'll find it actually uses a unique coenzyme called the molybdenum cofactor. So hopefully this helped you out. See you in the next video.